I got it started because sometimes I don't forget. I forget and don't start it until 10 minutes or 20 minutes afterwards. So it's recording now. So nobody right. say anything bad. And uh, uh, we can all say hi to each other uh, or wave anyway. Hi. And uh, then uh, I'll mute everybody, I think. Let's see here, where's the mute? Uh, mute all. Okay. All right, so everybody's muted and I think Nancy needs to unmute herself. Everybody else is muted. Okay. Okay. So why we get started then. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me this morning in my studio so we can talk about color theory. Yay! So uh, what we're going to do very, very quickly, we only have two hours to cover a lot of information. So I hope you have all your supplies ready to go. We're going to start this morning by an overview of the color wheel. I'm going to change my view uh, so that we can see, let's see, that one. All right, so that we can see the color wheel that I'm using. I'm using the big Steve Quiller wheel because it's more visible to you. The smaller ones don't, don't work um, because you can't see the detail very well. But I'm just gonna cover it very briefly. On the outside of the color wheel, we have saturated the colors. That means these are one pigment hues. Pigments are combined to make these particular colors. And when you use them, they, they're very intense, very bright, the cleanest that they could possibly be. In between, let's see, we have primary colors, uh, usually red, yellow, and blue, always red, yellow, and blue. And they're uh, signified by this triangle. And in between those, we have our secondaries of green, orange, and purple. This, by the way, is my favorite color screen, the color scheme of green, orange, and purple. I love that. But in between them, we have secondaries, um, in, uh, tertiaries. Uh, like red orange and yellow orange and uh, blue greens and our red violets and our blue violets and et cetera that add spice and, and subtlety to our colors. Uh, so, but today what we're gonna do is we're gonna concentrate on just four particular parts of our color schemes. That means we're going to have most of our painting, uh, most of our painting in that particular uh, dominant hue. Like in this, like this lovely little color wheel I have over here. This is a, a Jill Ritter color wheel. And uh, all you have to do is put, is, let's see, I have, how do I get rid of this view? I have this over here. Okay. I can't see what you're seeing. There it is. Uh, on this Jill Ritter wheel, she has these cups. And if you put the dominant color, in this case, it's the winter scene, which is all blues, you put the blue in the cup, in the center of the cup, and it gives you your, uh, combining with your complement over here, it gives you your grays, and then you have your accents and your discords. I'm not gonna be using very many discords. You're gonna feel them, but you're not gonna see them. I think the most uh, that we are going to see on this particular color scheme is a little bit blue green, a little bit red violet. And we're just gonna have a real, a whole lot of fun. Now, you know that you can just about make every color that you need just by using the three primary hues of red, yellow, and, and uh, blue, but they're not very clean. They're not going to make your painting look very distinctive or uh, you're not gonna be able to see it across the room when you're in a competition. So that's why we concentrate on selecting colors that are as clean as possible so that we can, uh, they can be viewed across the, the room and your pain, people will be attracted to your painting and buy it more than the person next to you. So uh, with that kind of idea in mind, I'm going to begin. Now, see, Steve Quiller, Steve Quiller uses that idea too. This, of course, is his wheel. And if you think about his paintings, the paintings are very, very clean. 
because he just uses right out of the tube pigments that are already mixed for him instead of going across the color wheel and creating some of these like lovely olive green hues he just uh, grabs a tube of olive green that's um, already created for him that's going to be a little cleaner and brighter because it's uh, it's manufactured for that probably has a fewer hues in it than if we were to start fiddling on our, our palette. So he steps right around the color wheel as I am going to, or we're going to be stepping around the color wheel today. So we're going to start out uh, in our winter scene by using like these color wheels, these colors step right around the color wheel. This cobalt violet, red violet, here we get a little bit more blue uh, than we would have purple over here. Then we, we start moving into our blues up into our greens. That's kind of stepping right around the color wheel. It's a much gentler transitional uh, way to do it. And uh, it's a little easy on the eyes and makes your paintings look more polished. So with that, so we have our complements, we have our primaries, we have our secondaries, we have our tertiaries or intermediates. And so with that, I think I'm going to begin. So Nancy, a, quest a, a question for you. So um, how do you decide what colors to use? I mean, obviously there's gonna be a lot of blues in the winter, in the winter scene. Uh, what, mm -hmm. what, what did you start with? Did you say, oh, I definitely want a, you know, a cobalt blue kind of color as a, the key thing, but then I use, you know, I'll pick my other colors based on that. How did, how did you do that? Can you step us through the thought process? Sure, sure. Um, when I look at this scene, first I, I, I get an emotion, I have an emotion, I react to this and it, it, it takes me hours to pick photos. <laughs> it's not an easy thing. And then I play around with the design and then I start looking into it. Now, sometimes, as you know, when you look at my paintings, especially my portraits, I can, you know, make them very, um, the, the color will be abstracted, but in this case, this is not so much abstracted as it is. I think it's already a beautiful scene. I tweaked it, I photoshopped it, I went for it. I tried to intensify the colors that I felt uh, were present in this that would that would uh, evoke an emotion. So with that, already working on it in Photoshop, and if you don't know, I have Photoshop Lite, <clears throat> that means I, I, I'm not very good at it, and I use it uh, in a minimal way. I have the ways that I know how to use it uh, to intensify the color, but I'm not really good at moving shapes around and so forth. So what I'll do is I'll say, what about the particular scene I like? And in this case, it was all the soft blues uh, stepping right along. I'm looking into the trees and I see violets in the, the trees. I see some of these blue greens in, in these uh, closer trees to us. And that's really how I figure it out. Like over here, um, this is this blue has a little bit of gray in it as I come down, but I also see a little bit of purple. So to me, that's cobalt violet with um, cerulean blue. And if I come over here, just because I, I have a knowledge of color and the way it's gonna appear when it's dry, I know that that uh, cobalt blue is going to recede uh, more so than a more intense color like a thalo or an Antwerp or a Prussian um, or a, a cobalt teal, which is kind of like the color of my shirt I'm wearing today. So I not only think about the hue a color is, but I also think about its color property because I know cobalt blue is going to dry lighter. Um, because it's just not a very strong color. So I'll select cobalt blue to go back. But looking at my color wheel again, we know that cobalt blue is over in this area. So if I wanted to step around the color wheel, then I would go like if this, this tree has more contrast in the color application because I wanted to have this look a little greenish underneath, way underneath, I'm put a little, little viridian to start with, and a little bit of 
uh, let's see, I'm going to go back and forth between cobalt violet and uh, Indian Three and Blue is a very interesting color. I like it quite well. I think this particular color scheme has ultramarine blue and in Antwerp, Antwerp, and Cerulean. So really, Ralph, I get those colors actually from the reference itself. And what I'm trying to showcase to, to um, portray my emotions to the scene. I mean, I can't portray your emotions, right? But I because I'm the artist, I select colors that portray the emotion that I'm trying to show. And in this case, it was soft, it was winter, uh, hence the colors side by side on the color wheel instead of jumping across. Um, yeah, you're not trying to be jarring. You're basically trying to set a mood. Be subtle. I'm trying to be subtle. And very, now very soft like scheme. snow. Yeah. It is an, it, this is, this is a split analogous, meaning uh, it, it, you, you come across the color wheel. Um, let's see, viridian is the complement of cobalt violet. And so there's a, you know, the viridian and the violet are in there and they're complementary. So that's, that's where you get that discord going on. But it's felt rather than seen, as you'll see. And working with this paper, the purpose of using a color rough is to try colors out, try values out. Uh, and just being able to print it off get, is more creative because you're not afraid of making mistakes. Okay, does that explain it, Ralph? Yes, I think so. Nancy? Yes? Uh, it's Rebecca, I have a quick question. If you were to plug those colors into that other color wheel, the Jill Ritter color wheel, is that mm -hmm. accent color, the purple? Would that be that accent color? I'm just curious. I, I have never used that color wheel, it's kind of, Intriguing. Oh, this is a wonderful color wheel and it's available online. Uh, the accent color down here, actually the discords on here are green, like I'm going to be using, but here and here, it's a little bit off. See how that this isn't exactly, it should be, but it, on, on this color wheel, if I go from purple to yellow green, they should be right across the color wheel. Let's see if they are on, on the Steve Quiller wheel. It, pink. See, like that. Mm -hmm. So that's that to me is the discord because you have your analogous going around the color wheel and then you take one and you go across and mm -hmm. that's your split analogous, see, analogous. And then you split it and go across. Okay, thank is that, you. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the things that um, I, you know, the color wheel teaches, there's so much to learn about the color wheel and it just depends on who designed which color wheel you're using. There's just not one standard <laughs> color wheel. They're all a little mm -hmm. bit different. Steve's is a little bit different than, than Jill's is a little bit different. And so is um, this wonderful hand print color wheel that I always like to send out. They're gonna be a little bit different. Nancy? Uh, yes, ma'am. When you, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, when you talk about discord, can you just, are those the colors you absolutely would never use in that painting? Oh, no, no, no. Discords are like your, your spice, your salt and your pepper and, and maybe your chili powder um, to, make, to make your scene pop. So you're going to mostly take these colors and put them around your focal point to make it more exciting. I see. Does that help? Yeah. yeah so yes, I wondered what the discord was. So um, that helps. But you're helps. not going to use yeah. a, a huge amount of that, right? You're going to use oh, it in no. collected places? You're going to feel it. Uh, I, when we start painting, I'll talk about that because I'm going to start putting it down first so that when the color is on top of it, you're going to be looking through the colors that are applied last. And you'll look through and you'll see little hints of that purple, little hints of that green. Um, let me begin and so that I can demonstrate it. We're vis very visual people. And it, the way to get a point across to us is really to show it, not to say it, right? Yeah. And Nan Nancy, I will be timing you as you ask. So in 15 minutes, I will let you know that that's where All we are. All right. All right. So we're, I hope you know how I like to, to talk. So you've got to really rein me in. <laughs> there you go. 
This is a little out of focus for me. Is that anybody else? Let's it see. is a little out of focus. Let me. Um, oh, you know what? That is going to also be your monitor. Because if I look at my monitor on my laptop, it's a little out of focus. If I went into my computer, my big computer, it would be perfectly in focus. It's very frustrating that way. I hope Zoom figures out, I, I guess maybe they can't because everybody's monitors are different. Whether you look at it on a laptop or an iPad or a phone or uh, whatever, your, your monitor is going to um, have, we're all gonna have different resolutions. And sometimes- well, it doesn't happen with other ones, so I don't think a, that's the case. I think it needs to be focused, if I can. Well, the, the uh, palette is focused, but the- uh, Yeah, see this? That's what we were talking about, Ralph. But the picture isn't focused. Is there a focus that you see, can- See, that's what we were talking about. Uh -huh. So why is this focused and this isn't? I do not know. I do not know either. Move your picture over there and let's see. Just move your picture over there on top of that. You're right. It is more in focus. Is it more in focus for you? A little bit. Or is it just just a little bit, but not enough to the spend our time talking enough. about it, I guess. Right. Well, the paintbrushes I mean, I... aren't in focus either. So I think the camera needs to be focused. Uh, there isn't any way to focus the camera. Hmm. We should move along. Actually, I actually <laughs> I do see the, the paintbrushes do seem to be in focus for me. So anyway, let's go ahead. Yeah, I'm not sure how to take no care of that. Thank it you. is an Thank ongoing you. problem. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and like we said, we're going to begin here. And I'm going to be taking and painting the background color, which is uh, Viridian. A little bit of Viridian. We talked about doing a little blue green, which is the Discord. Get a little Discord going on in our fir tree here, just to hint. And of course, I'm using a uh, synthetic brush because we don't want to uh, over apply too much water to this surface because it's not an non absorbent surface. Are we painting along, Nancy? No, uh, you're go I'm going to go ahead, Ralph. No, I was just saying, no, we're gonna wait till Nancy gets done, then we'll, we'll paint. First, she's gonna finish the first exercise and then we'll do ours. And also just a little bit, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the Vibit also. Okay, so now I'm gonna, coming right around with my blues. I think you can see them quite well in the, on the on in your monitor. Nancy, while you're painting, can you tell us what you like about the um, Indian Throne Blue? Um, oh yes, I'm not familiar with it. Um, an Indian Throne Blue or Indian Three, depending upon the manufacturer. Uh, it's a transparent hue. It doesn't have black in it like uh, indigo. So it's meant to kind of replace indigo on your palette because it's capable of getting almost black without imparting actual black to your uh, painting or paints gray. If you added a little tiny tad of, of uh, brown matter to it, you pretty, you'd have a black, black, you know, if you would want to have a black, black, you would have a black, black. Um, but that, those are the reasons it's transparent. It mixes well. It's capable of getting very, very, very dark. 
and it's very clean. Thank you. You are welcome. How, in your experience, Nancy, are, are um, what Viridian and Thalo green different? Oh my, they're very different. It's sort of oh. like um, when you go to a wedding and uh, you sit next to somebody that's a really loud talker, uh -huh. you know, and you can't hear anything because they're in your ear. That's uh -huh. that's Thalo green. It's really loud, and if anything that comes next to it is just overwhelmed. But Viridian. It, yeah. Okay. Rudian is not a stainer. It's not very loud. Ah, uh, okay. I'm going to now, I'm going to go to Antwerp. So I'm just going to blues that are side by side on the color wheel to start with. And I'm trying to paint very quickly because I know I don't have very much time. Start to play William Tell Overture in my head. When we start to hear, hear William Tell, we'll let you know. Okay. Wouldn't that be fun to be able to, you know, pick a tune in your head and just play it for everyone? How would, what would you like to hear today? <laughs> <laughs> How silly. Oh, it's so nice to paint with all you guys. I always feel so happy to know, to be able to connect, to know you're all out there and you're all well. Just a little bit more patience and you'll probably be over. Six months, what do you think, six months? I think we'll be pretty far past it by then. Yeah, I hope so. People are starting to take the vax vaccine. There we go. There we go. So now, just like we talked about to begin with, this is split analogous. I'm taking these blues that are side by side on the color wheel. And I will, I promise you, I apologize for this blurriness. I don't know why this is in, in focus and that isn't. Does is there something wrong with the camera? I wish we had someone that knew about such things. You know, why the periphery is in, in focus, but the, the center. So what is, is the not. device that you're using to show this, this scene? What, you have an iPad or what do you have? Uh... I have, um, I have a, a, a device that's actually made for Zoom. Uh, up here, it's a webcam, a special webcam. I have uh -huh. two of them. And they're supposed to be just the very best. Now, like I said, when I go into my other room, it is much better in focus. But then one of the people said that that's not the case on her end uh, from her experience. So I don't know what to tell you. I will investigate it, though. Maybe I, I have a bad camera. Yeah, contact uh, product support and see whether they can help you. Yeah, for sure, because it's an important thing have everybody be able to see. So can you see again? I know. See, I have this taped down, so it's completely flat. Let's see if I brought it over here. It's better. It's better for me. Better for me. Just a little bit, huh? Yeah. But the palette's going to be out, so we have to sacrifice sure. one thing for the other, you know? Yeah. Try bringing it closer to the camera. Well, then I can't paint. No, just try it just to see whether we can see any focus. I can't, for example, I can't read those words underneath there. If there's a, they're pretty blurry. So I think it needs to be farther away. Yeah, no, that that's still blurry, even though they're bigger. Yeah. Bigger blur. <laughs> yeah, see. Yeah. Oh well, let's worry about it. Oh next well. Time. Yeah, we we will we will overcome. 
We're about at 15 minutes now, Nan. Okay. Okay. Violet? Yeah, cobalt violet. I do have cobalt violet here. And uh, I'm going to be applying some Antwerp blue. Just all of the colors that were uh, on the mock up that you got. Okay, back to Indian Throne. You know, with these particular light, uh, sort of very transparent hues, for me at least, if I put indigo in there, what a mess it makes. It just looks black, and like I put poked a hole in my painting. Because it's just, just like putting a sumo wrestler in the middle of the nutcracker sleeve. And what yes, color are you putting? Is that your violet? That no. is Indian Throne Blue. It's very dark. It makes a fabulous violet. If you were to take a and Crimson and mix it with that, oh my goodness, it's beautiful. It, depending upon the manufacturer, it's either warm or cool. Uh, sometimes it's made with Thalo Blue and sometimes it's made with Ultramarine Blue. The two uh, major uh, manufacturers of pigment is uh, are Winsor Newton and Daniel Smith. They each have their own take on it. One's warm and warm, warm, one's cool. And I'm not exactly sure which is which. What are you I, using yeah. now? That's Indian Throne Blue. No, what brand? Oh, I, like I said, I can't remember exactly which brand I'm using right now. Uh, it seems to be warmer, so I would guess, I'm guessing now uh, that it is Daniel Smith. Okay. Now to, to get in here, I'm going to act just a little bit of out here on the sides of this uh, color cup here, I've got some Andrews turquoise. And so I'm gonna add that just for spice. Ooh, that's pretty. Ooh, that's so pretty. Okay. I'm pretty happy with that. typically do this type of a pre-painting before you get started on a painting? Um, for landscapes, yes. For a portrait, no. And uh, for me, uh, landscape has a lot of variables. Um, and I have to think about what genre I'm painting in. Sort of like if I'm painting a plein air painting, um, I will tend to use my grays more. And I'm thinking design really design so that I try to envision it uh, in a no tan in a black and white, you know, and move the shapes around and so forth. But when I do an interpretive landscape like this, are we done? Uh, interpretive landscape like this, um, there are so many things to be aware of. I played with this design for a couple of hours just, and it looks so simple, right? It looks like it's such a mm -hmm. simple interpretation. But I changed the trees, uh, Photoshop the trees. They're not in the right, the same um, orientation. Change the values um, and so forth. So I, I play around a lot with design using these. So yes, when I do landscape, I do use them. 
Dan, so I, I'd like to ask a question. I, I, I've been fascinated by the snow on the trees up there. Are you planning uh -huh. to put any snow up there? And if so, how do you go about? Um, oh, well, first of all, I would select if I was gonna put snow up there, um, I think I'd probably get a, a, a reference that was more descriptive of snow. Um, it's a little, it, this isn't really snow on the reference. I don't know if you can- well, How about on the top it. of the, the white trees, at the top of the white? Oh, yeah. the white tree. That's all negative painting. And that was one of the things that I changed out on this. If I were to do that, I'd probably take a sponge and um, I would, let's see, so, so yeah, I'd, I'd take a sponge. I'd take a sponge would, and I'd take a blue and I would come back here like this. And then I would come out and I would do the, the uh, branches like that um, with this. But of course, this, on this paper, you're just not gonna be able to do it. But if you were no. to do this and you were inspired now to go back and do it, um, which is a different kind of interpretation, you could do it negative painting by coming behind the tree like I am right now, which is one thing I had to change to create contrast to pop those trees out. I darkened the sky behind it okay. to make the, the, uh, the shapes come forward. Mm -hmm. And then you could take a sponge and indicate that. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Nancy, another question. So let's say you're happy with this rough. Um, uh -huh. when, you, when you go to start your actual painting on a watercolor paper, what uh -huh. do you do differently or how do you how do you use the rough in painting the final scene well the rough you have your your uh, shapes figured out you have your values figured out you have your colors figured out and now all you have to do is have an impeccable application easier said than done right so uh i enlarge everything um i mix up my colors so that i have little pots of each one of the hues so that when I come in and I make the application, uh, all the granulation shows the pigment is at its best. I'm not coming back to my palette and trying to mix it over here, which already overworks the color. So I activate the color in these little dishes that I have stacked up over here on my desktop. And then I select a brush that's appropriate for uh, whatever, whatever texture I'm trying to convey whether it's smooth or it's stippling or it's I'm, I'm trying to uh, portray the granulation. And then I, I, I do my application very carefully. And if I'm not pleased, I do it again, okay. see? So it is the, uh, so you, you, know. <laughs> have, you have about four or five puddles already? You've made four? Or five well, they're puddles? listed on, underneath the, the sketch on the, the winter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They're but, right there. And where are your puddles? Your work well, for, for this particular exercise, since I don't have very absorbent paper, I don't have them made. But okay. if we had another class and we addressed application, I would take one of these and we would probably enlarge it and we'd spend three hours working on it. Just this one. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think, I think we should get started think, with the uh, student work. Okay, it's time for you guys to um, to do your little rough over here, and remember to use a synthetic brush and not oversaturate the paper. And I'll be here standing by for any questions you have. Okay. Have fun. Nancy? Yes? Hi, where did you get those cute little round dishes? They look ceramic or porcelain. Yeah, I love them. Um, my husband keeps taking them from me because he likes to eat um, oriental food and he likes to put his dipping sauces. And that's what these are. These are actually oriental bowls for dipping sauces. And I, get, I got them at the Asian stores 
Now online, there's a place called OAS. It's an Asian art supply company and they sell them. If you can't make it down to Convoy Avenue where they're sold, they have Asian shops down there and you can walk in and buy and they're like a dollar a piece. They're fabulous, these little, yeah, little that, bowls. That makes good sense. Good, um, See, I have a bunch of them and this not even all that I have, but it makes a big difference. You know, I started getting big awards when I started paying attention to the quality of my pigments. Before yeah. I had all the design down, the color down and everything, but I didn't pay attention to my paint application, uh, the quality of my paint. So when I did, it made a big difference. It probably makes them much more consistent. It, it, you can predict uh, what, you're, you know, what you're doing. Of course, then you select your paper, uh, depending upon what kind of texture you want in the look. Like sometimes in my, my portraits, it just bothers me because I look at the portrait and I see the texture first before I see anything and that's not good. So I, I've been switching to hot press with that. It just depends on what you're trying to say. So with like a plein air landscape, that texture in a paper works with you, you know, and it's a, it's a benefit, but um, not in sometimes, not sometimes. Do you- Steve Quiller, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, do you use uh, 140 or 300? And also, have you noticed a change in um, some of the brands of paper? Um, over the years, yes, I've noticed a change in the paper. Arch has really changed at one point, probably about 10 years ago. It was very frustrating because uh, they sold their company and the company that took them over, in my opinion, did not take the care that what the paper that had the company had previously taken. Um, and so we were getting marks in the paper you put down a flawless wash you know you do all this stuff and then you mix up the color and you're expecting then to have a flawless wash with these very soft Kalinsky sable brushes so you've invested in all of the equipment and everything and then you hit an area on the paper that's got an imperfection in it is just really frustrating and have to start again because you had hoped that it was going to be a showpiece um, yeah, that was nasty uh, because it was um, imperfectly sized. So the sizing was inconsistent with the arches paper. So yes, I have noticed a change in, in the quality of the papers. The other thing is that with the, uh, with the paints, there's a big change in the paints. Also about 10 years ago, or maybe even longer, uh, according to the um, safety, uh, requirements with the paints, you know, with the cadmiums and so forth, with the water supply, a lot of the pigments are no longer made with cadmiums. And so they've tried to make substitutions for it. The hue matches, but the quality of the paint isn't there, in my opinion. Um, cadmium sits right on the surface and I like to use it as my last application for wet, for what I want people to see first, I do last. Um, so for paint that I don't need to mix it, I want to look really, really bright. I'll use a cadmium. Oh, so I have use all these transparents on the bottom, but as, as the painting gets more and more finished, I'll switch to cadmium uh, for pop. Does that help? But they, they changed all these. I can't predict. I used to know them by heart and I could tell what looking at them what was in the tube, but that's not the case anymore, sadly. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Nancy? Yes. Hi, this is Ann. Can you again uh, talk through your strategy of why you use um, 
different colors in different places. You know, on the left side, you've kind of got the teal, then kind of the pinky, lavender, violet, whatever in the center. Sure. Then, yeah. Sure. That's um that's a design technique. I I'm doing something uh, that you know there are different aspects of design, and um, uh, let's see what's the word for it. So when you go from one area to another and you subtly slowly change, it's not granulation, but it's similar similar word to that. Um, let me think about it. It's, it's subtly going from one area to another area. It's sort of like uh, laying on a graded wash. It's Gradient. gradation, sorry, it's gradation. Um, so see, that's the thing about me is that once I'm visually engaged, my auditory uh, memory kind of is, goes to the side. Does that, I don't know if anybody's brain works like that, like mine does, but mine, when I'm visually engaged, um, that part of my brain is bigger. <laughs> it's just accessed that way. But anyhow, it's gradation. It's an aspect of design. So you wanna go from darker to lighter, from warmer to cooler, uh, to busy to, you know, to uh, plain. Um, and it's also called alternation. It keeps your picture plane interesting. There's something also going on with the shapes, which is another aspect of design. So these color applications are shapes. We have a mama, papa, baby. Here we have a mama shape, a papa shape over here, which is this large violet shape. And then we have a smaller shape over here. And then we have another accent over here. So they're not all the same. It's to, to visually, it's more visually exciting to have an, um, an, a variety, which is another aspect of design. Um, it's just all about design. Does that answer your question? You just, you, there. I don't have a roadmap that says, okay, now I need to do this. It's something you learn from experience. Okay, what does this need? Oh, I don't have enough variety in my shapes. Oh, I don't have, uh, um, what does that feel like it needs? Sometimes I see things in my head before I do it. I know that can be frustrating to people. It's something you will learn with time if you keep doing it. When it looks right, it is right. See over here, there's an accent right here. And if you were to divide this into thirds, you'll find that uh, it's kind of like on, a, on a, a, an area where, let's see, not it's not the golden mean, but it's a place where you could put the focal point. If you divide it into thirds like that, you have four places where in this rule of thirds, a, a focal area would look good. Does that help? Thank you, yes. Okay. I think maybe just a few more minutes for your rough, color rough.
Let's see. How's everybody doing? Maybe they're muted, Ralph. I think they are. My, my paper is wrinkling. <laughs> I think that's a, a given with the, the uh, copy paper, right? It depends, you know, you get better at it. Like mine is not, but you know, I'm not a, a novice to this technique. You have to kind of, you know, make sure you're, it's not over. Nancy, what did you put under the trees on the far right where it's uh, maybe grayish? On the right. Far right. The other right, <laughs> yes. Up, uh, yeah, about halfway up the page or a third. You, you went kind of gray under the trees, under the trees. Yes. I don't hear you if you're saying anything. Let's see. Nancy, you're muted, I think. Yeah, Nancy's you're muted. muted. How come it does that? All right, all right. Um, over here, this is an application of cobalt. We did that. And then I put in this cobalt violet and then it appears, it only appears to be grayish because the colors around it are brighter. Uh, and that's an optical illusion. There's that was not grayed down at all. That's why I like to use cobalt because cobalt is a weaker color, it goes back, it mixes beautifully. Um, and that's just cobalt blue. And it's very clean. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting. Color is an interesting thing because it uh, changes according to what's next to it. It's perception, anyhow. And is the, I'll call it the stream, is that left white or is there a color in it? Is that cobalt? Right there. That's white, white. That's the white of the page. Thank I you. try to leave that the white of the page. In fact, there's the white of the page. It goes like this up here. There's a trail of white accents around this to lead the eye through the composition. Nancy, which uh, well, what are we going to do next? OK, we are going to be doing this uh, summer scheme, color scheme. And it's tertiary. Tertiary means uh, the colors that are in between, like, um, let's see. It's all made comprised of secondary hues. It's just. Colors that, let's see, where's the color wheel? Oh, it's over here. There we go. All right. Let me go over here, toggle back and forth. There we go. All right. All right. There you are. Okay. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to switch and we're going to be concentrating on the secondary uh, colors. 
Those are um, orange, uh, green, and um, purple, mostly. We have a little bit of blue in here, but we're use, just using it to mix with. We're not going to be actually seeing it in our design. So I'm going to toggle back over here. I'm just toggling so that you know that I'm here and I think it helps to see the presenter. It's there a real person. It's a real person, yeah, it's just not a disembodied voice. Okay, so we're gonna be concentrating on the orange here and the green and the violets in this area. Our, our dominant pigment is actually going to be green. We're going to be mixing our, our cobalt violet with that green and uh, get some very interesting hues that way. Get some interesting browns uh, and shades that you don't normally think about because we don't use cobalt violet as a mixing color, but it is actually very nice mixing hue. So with that, I am going to close that up and go ahead and begin. So I've taken out my sketch. This is the summer sketch. And like we said, green is going to be our dominant pigment, although I'm not going to be using any two greens in this. We're going to be mi mixing all of our greens. And what do you have as the uh, what do you have as the pop color in here? Uh, what are the accent colors? Yeah. Let's take a look. All right. That's what is, I have these color wheels uh, literally at my fingertips around my studio because it just helps to see things. So with this, I'm going to turn this around and I'm going to come over here and I am going to emphasize my green palette. So with the green palette, it really is just wonderful. We have a discord of a violet and uh, sort of an orange red. I'm looking at that, is that vermilion? Yeah, it kind of looks like vermilion. Uh, and I do see that in my sketch. I do see it on the trunk of the tree up in here, just little bitty pops. There's another one of pop right there. There's another little bitty pop right there. But when you look at this thing, you don't really see them until you know, you're directed to look for them. Yes, you're, you're gonna find those little bitty pops. Uh, the purple in here, I think the darker purples are in, in places. They're just like adding your uh, jalapeno pepper, just a little bit of spice. Just a little bit of spice and the compliment is down here at the bottom. Just your beautiful, beautiful red violet, blue violet. So with that, I will take this up here and tape it down and begin. Now, because we're mixing our hues, I'm gonna start out with yellow. And I'm gonna start out with the lightest, palest, most mixable color that we have. Uh, in this case, sometimes I use Oriolinen because it is a wonderful hue that way. And sometimes I use um, Windsor, Yellow, uh, Windsor yellow, and that's what I'm going to use today. It's very bright, very clean. It's right there. See, and I'm making a little puddle of it, trying to not keep this too wet, take off some of the wetness into a towel. I have a towel line that my um, area with a white towel that never gets white again once I start using it because it turns grayish from all the color in it. There we go. And, and if you notice with my strokes, I'm helping to control the pigment and the water by not going in a back and forth application. I'm actually creating these little X's. See like that? And that way I can also intersperse whites. See like that, that that's what helps to keep it from getting oversaturated. There's a method to our madness. Okay, so now I'm going into blues. Uh, over here I said that I used 
ultramarine blue to create this blue. Activate that color. There we go. And then we can layer it. I'm going to take some of the water off and kind of come in here. Just right over top of that yellow. And optically, as it dries, it will start to create a green. And once we start applying our, our cobalt, uh, our Andrews turquoise or cobalt teal, it will also help. Okay, that's our, you know, our orange. So we put it up there, not too wet. Not too wet. So I'm putting the color kind of side by side. That in that way also it helps to control the amount of water on the surface. Oops. Did you mix an orange or what orange? No, uh, it is actually cadmium orange on my palette. I'm, I'm mixing it, putting it side by side, the color. This creates a kind of a simultaneous contrast that I love. Okay. What, what are you using now? Looks like purple. That was, that was a cobalt violet. All the colors are at the bottom of your sheet here. Okay, I'm not, I really am, I'm just gonna use those. So if it looks like violet, it's violet, cobalt violet. And this is Andrew's turquoise or cobalt teal. Would I have and, a problem? Is there a problem? Go ahead. Is there a problem using Windsor Violet? Yes, it, it is. It's got too much value. Okay. Um, okay. and uh, it's a stainer. Okay. It, it's not going to dry back uh, this way. Now I know cobalt violet is a very expensive color. Not a lot of people um, have it. So if you were going to substitute. Uh, or try to mix the hue. I would take, if you have any rose matter genuine, it's rose matter genuine and cobalt blue, or rose matter genuine and cerulean blue will give you, you know, an acceptable substitute uh, yeah. for that. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I'm using uh, cobalt violet from M. Graham. Uh-huh. It looks yours looks way pinker than mine. I don't know if yeah. it's my can if it's my just my video, you know, my computer or if it's the color. No. Um I use uh cobalt violet by Winsor Newton. It's a beautiful color. That that particular hue can be um can vary a lot depending upon the manufacturer. Um See if I have it behind me. Hold on. See, I use a book. I don't anymore because I know. I know my preferred pigments. But this book, this is Hillary Page's Guide to Watercolor Pigments. Before you know, you go out and you test a lot of colors to find out. She's tested them for you, and she will tell you the properties in the colors. Um, and you can select for yourself which one that you want to use. Uh, it's invaluable. It's 
it's out of uh, not in print anymore, but you can get it from her. But see, this is all cobalt violet. I don't know that you can see, but this is all cobalt violet and mm -hmm. the different manufacturers. So I would advise you to pick up one of these books from her. If you can get it from her website. Um, are, aren't they changing the formulation of the, plant, the paints, as you said before? Uh, are they um, I would say cobalt violet is not changed. Some hues like your cadmium red, your cadmium orange, depending upon, and she will tell you which ones. She has updates to this. Uh -huh. I have it in here. Uh, and she sends out the updates. So if you have a, if you buy her book, she sends you the updates about what's changing. Her website's hillarypage.com, one L in Hillary. Did you find it? Yes. HillaryPage.com. Okay, so now I'm, I'm, you know, one of my very favorite greens in the whole world for world for a summer green is uh, Andrew's turquoise or cobalt teal, and your new gamboge. Uh, your, cat, your cadmium yellow medium. It is just a fabulous, it's your, what you call golf course green. It's so bright and beautiful. I don't know if you can see that or not. So that's turquoise and what? Uh, it's uh, turquoise and just your warm yellow, like a new gamboge uh -huh. um, or, or a cadmium yellow medium. Uh, down on this tree, see, I'm gonna create an optical brown. Um, I'm not gonna get to have a lot of contrast in this particular little sum summer scene. If I wanted to have contrast, I would probably use some burnt sienna and uh, put a little bit more blue in it. But but in this scene, I just feel like summer and I'm gonna create a brown out of new gamboge and uh, cobalt violet, it's right there. And so I'm going to I'm going to add it right now, kind of wet into wet, making those little X strokes to try to keep the paper uh, dry. Er, come up, tree. Now, if I wanted in to have more contrast, I just thought of something that would be brilliant and still be in the same color family. And I don't have it on the color sketch, but I could add it right now just for fun. Is magenta, uh, quinacridone magenta would be a wonderful color that would be in this color family and would give us kind of a wonderful, um, nice red dark. Where is it? It's right there. Yep, there he is. He looks bright. I'm just going to add that in there. I could go add a little bit of. Okay. So we are doing, Nick, creating this painting just from secondaries, our purples, our oranges, and our sort of blue greens. With an emphasis on the greens.
Now I am adding the accent using this uh, cobalt uh, violet as my accent color. And I've got to make, uh, it's just such a splendid color, the impulse to kind of make it um, more than an accent and let it take over is, is too much. So I've got to make sure that green is my dominant hue. Go back and check to make sure the green is the dominant hue. So that's what I'm doing right now. And you can, once these dry, you can go back and, and work on them. Um, my hope is that you will find these to be very, very helpful. How did you create that dark on the tree trunk? Uh, that, well, I slipped into uh, Quinacridone magenta or just magenta. And you can create magenta out of ultramarine blue with alizarin crimson. Hi, Nancy. Does this one have the same composition strategy as the other one where you've kind of gone from light to dark and or is it different? Uh, the, the trans, uh, the gradation. Right. Um, uh -huh. No, I'm actually not. I'm actually doing something called simultaneous contrast where I put complements against one another. Um, the, the uh, cobalt violet and the yellow green are complementary. Uh, and that is not going side by side on the color wheel as we did with this. See how gentle that looks? It's side by side on the color wheel. Even the violet is um, right yeah. around the color wheel. We have ultramarine blue and then we have violet and then we have red violet, et cetera, where this is a huge jump right there between the orange and the uh, red violet. That's a huge jump or between the uh, red violet and the yellow green behind it is a huge jump. So it's not the same strategy. It's more of a complementary strategy. Thank you. You're welcome. Nancy, I think we should be moving on. We've got about an hour left or so, and we got- Okay, it's do. time for you to paint. So go ahead and begin this particular exercise. Okay, how about uh, putting in one of your discords that you talked about in this painting? Well, in this painting, we have red violet and we have orange and they're right there. We have orange and we had red violet. Okay. You're already there. All right. Okay. You thought you caught me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you could also put in a, a red, a real red. You could. You could. I'm not ready for that right now. I, I, uh, this is really too wet. Yeah. But uh, as you paint yours, then I'll watch. Come back and look, and you'll probably see. Oh my! Look at those little red dots. I didn't see those before. Okay. I'll put them in as it dries up a little bit. I promise. Thanks for reminding me. I think maybe this this part right here is dry enough. Let's drop in a little red dot. In this case it's vermilion and it was a fortune. I don't mind telling you to buy this color. It was like $22. I about dropped my teeth. There it is. Bang. Was it worth it? <laughs> okay. Is it worth the $22 for that tube of paint? 
Let's see if it pops over here. Have you used a uh, pyrrol orange, which looks kind of like that? <sighs> oh, yes. Um, I have. For me, it sinks too much. S-I-N-K-S sinks too much. So when I get to the end of a painting, I'll select something that has the cadmium in it uh, that's really thick that I know won't sink into the surface of the painting. And uh, that's why I select vermilion. This is cadmium. So it could be cadmium scarlet. Um, they don't sink. They stay right up on, on the top of the painting. They're opaque? They are opaques. Thank you. And, uh, ca uh, and pyro orange or perylene orange or the rest of the orange are not. They are more transparent or semi-opaques, but they sink so much. There we go. All right.
Nan? Yeah? Uh, this is Rhonda, I have a question. Sure. Um, obviously we're painting on printed pictures there where everything is there. When you're mm -hmm. painting landscapes yourself, how much do you, is actually drawn out on your paper? Oh gosh. Well, if I'm plein air painting very little, it's just an indication of placement. Uh, that means painting out in the field, you know. Right. Uh, uh, for my landscape painting, it just depends on what I'm doing. If, if it's a, a technique like John Salonen's technique, you know, a cityscape, I might spend two days drawing it up, two full days drawing it up. So, mm -hmm. what about a typical a, a typical landscape like the ones we're like doing, were doing, like these that we're doing? I guess is that oh, uh, like I said at the beginning, for me, landscape is a puzzle. I'm putting together a puzzle. When I look at a landscape, there are so many things that can be changed about it to make it better. If I were to look out my window. Uh, at the view across the street and I see my neighbor's house, I could paint the house just the way it is. That would be boring. To me, it would be boring, right? Uh, I would deal with the shapes. Are the shapes in the best place for the design? Do I need to move the shapes around? I will, I will have to think about that, right? Then do I have to make, ch change the values around? Then I'll play around with these these sorts of different things are called no-tans, uh, where you change the values around in order to, to uh, make your statement more personal. Like in this little, these trees that we did, that changed the sky and made the sky dark to push, pull, to, to emphasize the trees. So I will put quite a lot of thought into a landscape. Um, that I don't do with a portrait. It just depends on what I'm doing, typically. I do, I do uh, play on my paintings quite a lot. I'm, I'm more of an analytical painter and, and not an uh, intuitive painter when it comes to landscapes. There's just so many variables. It's just too much fun to change things around. It's like I said, it's like putting, for me, putting together a big puzzle and how I can make that statement more personal uh, and make it better. Uh, it's, so it's just not replicating what I see. It's more like, how do I evoke what I feel more so? So every painting for me is different. Okay. And when you do people- Landscaping, you, I mean. Yeah, when you do people, are you doing, you're using the same color principles, but Obviously. I'm using the same color principles and same design principles, but when I'm doing a, a portrait, it is more intuitive in that I discover what the painting is trying to say to me in process. Uh, it, it, it will change from beginning to end. Um, and it, there, at some point in the painting, uh, I'll get an insight into which direction the painting wants to go and I'll let it take the lead on that. It's kind of hard to describe, but uh, yeah. yeah more... I, know you, I know you did a workshop on the portraits, which I missed. Is there any chance of buying like a video? Did you video record that or? Uh, you know, that's something I need to work on. I've, I've got, got a commitment, some painting commitment. I have to do two really, really, really good paintings. And then once they get done, I'll be able to devote my time into getting some portrait, um, instructional portraiture videos online. That is my goal. Uh, but I am obligated right now in the near future to get these two paintings done and they're hanging over my head. Like, no. <laughs> you know, like this, <laughs> but this is a blade. And then I feel like <laughs> I it's that, that uh, what, is, what is it called? The pit and the pendulum. Um, right. <laughs> and I have to, and it's a, I'm a kind of a little obsessive compulsive. I, before I can relax, I have to take care of that. 
And that means I will do it over and over until I get it right. Um, and then I promised you, because you're not the only one that's been kind of after me to do this. Uh, I do have, I know that the Watercolor Society taped that video that uh, I gave a workshop for them, a two day workshop for them. But I think that that's their intellectual property. Oh, and so I I'd have to contact them to see if they'll- I, I, I it, it, And it's brave new world. I don't know what we, what, They've decided with them, but I, I don't feel good in, uh, I had to get that video from them. It wasn't even my property. If the property is of the person who records it, in other words, Ralph hired me, it's Ralph's, in, as far as I know, unless Ralph and I were to work out something ahead of time. Um, but this is a, a very new technology uh, and so we haven't figured out everything uh, about that. But I would say contact the Watercolor Society and see what they think. If you wanted to purchase that video from them, that's up to them. Because I, I having been an illustrator and worked in the world, world of contracts and copyrights, uh, I know intellectual property. And that's something to be aware of. Uh, so contact them. Go ahead. This is Katie. I, I believe I have you as a premier workshop coming up this in 2021, right? For the Watercolor Society. Uh, not that I know of. Oh, I'll check my schedule then. Thanks. No, let me know. I'll check it now because, because you know, <laughs> yes, things fall through the cracks and maybe somebody said, well, I, would, I meant to ask Nancy about that and they put it up and didn't tell me. Okay, but I think on. there's a big, you know. yeah, yeah, there's a big long process when you are um, when you are contacted to uh, do a workshop. It's a big long process. So I think it's probably someone else. I wish it were me, but it's not probably not. I, I'm going to check my schedule right now. I'll be right back. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we should probably move on. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So the next one we're going to do, let's see. Yes, I'm, going to, I'm just gonna to toggle this for a second so that you know that I'm breathing. Okay, here, over here, and over here. Okay, hi. Uh, so the next one we're going to do is, um, that has to do with our split complementary scheme. That's taking two colors and going across. Some people call it a tetradic scheme because it makes a big rectangle or a square. Um, so the two colors across from each other on either side of the color wheel are what we're gonna go for. So in this case, I think it's um, orange and blue and uh, let's see, orange and blue. Let's go back. So this is the fall fall picture, right? This is the fall. This is the fall scene, and so it's going to be orange and blue. In this case, I think it's cerulean blue and uh, cadmium orange, and over here, yellow and red violet. Um, so this red violet can be cobalt blue and rose matter. In this case, this little square right here I put down is actually cobalt violet. Uh, and this is Windsor lemon, but I'll be using a lot of new gamboge. And I use Lucas new gamboge because that's a color that's been reformulated, much to my chagrin. Nancy, would you set the uh, color wheel that way the, uh, that you have? Would you set it? I want to see what it looks like. Okay, okay. I, I think probably this artist, Joan Ritter, is going to be selling a lot of these color wheels. Am I right? So <laughs> I'm also going to be tilting my palette okay. around because I'm going to be using and emphasizing these hues. Right. And I'll be coming across to my blue, which you don't really see very well over here a little bit. You see a little bit over here. But um, yeah, I'm going to be working in this this area and on my let's take a look at that which color wheel is this again i missed that 
Tell us this what is, the link is. This is Jill Ritter, R-I-D-D-E-R, J-I-L-L, Jill Ritter, Ritter.com. She sells this color wheel. So if we take a look uh, at this little mock-up sketch I've done, this color rough, we're going to see the orange and the blue, right? So that's, a, that's given. But more subtle is the violet, red violet, and the yellow. And so let's go ahead and uh, this is mostly this kind of a blue painting, wouldn't you say? So let's move this little color wheel around until we get blue. So this is a tetradic. This is not really an analogous scheme. This is a tetradic scheme. So across from here and here, I think I better switch back to, yes, this is lovely, but this is a, a split analogous scheme all the time. Since, and like Jill, I love this scheme and I use it quite a lot. But going outside of that scheme into a, a tetradic stream right here on this handout that you that you got sent from Ralph. He was so kind to do that. At the bottom two rectangles, explain the rectangular tetradic color scheme and the square color scheme. And it shows the colors right there. Thanks Ralph for doing that because that's really helpful. So see the difference? Remember we talked about color wheels being different and yeah. color schemes, this is why. This is an example of that. So let's go over here and begin. So again, I'm gonna be using cerulean blue and I'm gonna come over here to cadmium orange right across there. And I'm gonna come down here to, um, let's see, I'm gonna actually come down here to my, I thought I said it was red, violet and yellow for my four colors. This and this, and that and that. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four, like that. Okay, let's close that up. If we don't have red violet, what could we use? You could use um, permanent rose or rose matter genuine and cobalt blue. If you had a little bit of white, don't don't tell anybody I said that, that would even make it better because cobalt violet is an opaque and the little bit of Chinese white would help to make that purple that you're creating a little bit more opaque. But if you don't care, um, then the hue itself can be created out of cobalt blue rose matter or, or rose matter genuine permanent rose. Okay, so let's go back here and let's quickly, I know that Ralph has an appointment, so we need to. No, 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 my appointment is canceled. The, the, we're on lockdown. <laughs> oh, good, yay. No, I'm sorry, Ralph, but it's good for us. <laughs> yeah, we are on lockdown, aren't we? Darn it. Okay. Just when get, we were getting used to the new normal. You should get the governor to sponsor your, your uh, Zoom classes, uh, uh, Nan, because uh, you're helping to keep uh, uh, California safe. Yeah, we're keeping people off the streets, aren't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Let's begin. And since this is primarily a blue painting, I'm gonna be using a lot of cerulean blue. I have two color pots, I mean two water pots, a warm one and a cool one that keeps, that helps to keep the water, uh, the, the pigments clean. Um, and because right now I have a purple pot of water and a yellow pot of water because the water is dirty. So coming over here, again, applying that sort of uh, random square, trying to keep the paper dry as possible in this process of application. I'm gonna go over some of these lines a little bit that helps to unite those trees with the back of the, yeah, the trees and the tops of these mountains to, with the background.
Yeah, well, well, that would be good. Hey, Ralph, you want to be my agent? Then you could call up the governor. Sure. <laughs> yeah. He and, I are, yeah that would be nice. he and I are just that like would... this, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, that would be wonderful. I almost went to his misguided lunch at uh, French Laundry up there in Napa, but uh, I had some other things I had to do, so I didn't get to attend. Is that right? Are you being no. serious or facetious? I'm being facetious. I mean, you never know. It's California, you know. <laughs> everybody knows everybody around here. OK. All right. See, I've created a sort of an underpainting of this blue where it's going to be. It's going to, looking at my little color sketch, it's going to be in the green, so I'm putting it under the green. I'm trying to save time here. Okay, so I've got that. And so now I'm going to be doing my underpainting of yellow, taking my Windsor yellow. And over here, kind of coming over here like that. This is actually a scene from Alaska. We got a phone call from my husband's brother, who was with his wife up in Alaska. This is his second wife. That's why I'm calling her his wife. His second wife that he's just married. And uh, they were up vacationing in Alaska. So they told us exactly where they were. So I brought up Google Earth and uh, took a little road trip. Do you ever do that? Take Google Earth road trips? It's so satisfying if you're the kind of person that likes to travel a lot, as I know a lot of you do. It's so I can't tell you how satisfying it is. So you bring it up on your desktop. And um, so you can travel down the highway. So you can go to Street View. Once you're in Street View, you use your mouse and set your mouse so the cursor is on the horizon. Click it and it takes, you shoot down the road. So you can go miles like that. You can look all around, it's 360 degree view. And so you can see what's going on beside you or down the road or behind you or whatever below you. It's fantastic. It's well, so how satisfying. You, that's how you got that image then? That's how I got this image. This image is right where my brother-in-law was at this little resort down the road. And I took a screenshot and turned the screenshot into a JPEG. And I sent the JPEG out to you. Don't you have to Isn't that Google? Split? Don't you have to credit Google for this image? Well, uh, one would think so, but it is so Photoshopped that they <laughs> couldn't tell where it had come from. They, I mean, I changed things around, Ralph. Even this, I changed. If you compare this with the photograph, and this was already, uh, this was already Photoshopped. This, this, I spent hours doing this, uh -huh. changing the colors and changing things around and then when I did the drawing of course I made things higher and lower and changed the trees and so is it their intellectual property anymore? No I think it's yours now. I, mean, I think it is mine now. <laughs> if they can't tell where it's come from it's fair game right? If you can tell where it's come from because people used to like to like to put that kind of uh, you know borrowing images um, into a court sort of a formula where, oh, if you change one or two things, that's enough. No, you got to be able to change it enough that they can't tell where it came from. That's the thing that's more challenging. Here I go, I'm uh, heading into my orange now and I'm overpainting with my orange. I'm trying to do this quickly. And then we'll do that poppy red violet stuff. It's so much fun. So no, I do that a lot. This year we, we had to cancel our plans. I just was broken hearted. Um, and, uh, but I've done plenty of armchair traveling on the computer and it is really satisfying. You could go to Abruzzo, Italy and go right up into the little village and take a walk through. Sometimes they, they will, um, walk, Google walk, so that you can walk into buildings. This is something you've got to, to explore because it's just so satisfying if you like to travel. 
Okay, so now I'm gonna be taking that cobalt red violet. And uh, trying to select places where it's dry, not because I don't want to blend the colors on the surface, it's just that I don't want to get the paper waterlogged. Okay. You know, who I learned all this uh, photoshopping from was, um, uh, let's see, a really wonderful artist. Um, gee whiz. Again, my, my brain is thinking, I'm painting, so it's hard for me to access the names. Not Chuck McPherson, come... is it? No. Well, if he's using it too, I didn't know that, but um, no, it's not. It's an artist that died a few years ago. Uh, a lot of our artists have died a few years ago, right? So that doesn't really help. Um, oh, it's Nick Simmons. Nick Simmons. Oh, yeah. He gave a class. Did you attend that class, Ralph? No, no I should have, but. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm so lucky to have been there um, because who knew, you know? But he, anyhow, he photoshopped his images to the nth degree and then copied them exactly how he photoshopped them. He made no changes. And so he's got paintings or photoshopped, what, what would you call them, preliminaries of his wife that are just beautiful and they, uh, he, hasn't, he wasn't able to live long enough to paint them. All right, so now I'm taking some of these darker tones. This is my Indian Threen, uh, and I believe this is my Ultramarine Blue, and I'm, I'm coming into my mountains now to add some depth, depth and interest to the mountains. Start with, with, coal, uh, with the uh, Ultra. up here like that. Uh, when I was an illustrator, we used to do these a lot because we would have to do mock-ups to, to show the client. And uh, that it helped us to have these so that we wouldn't get too far afield of what you know he had envisioned or the person had envisioned. Okay, so now I'm gonna be doing this, the stand of trees. These trees are, trees are created out of indenthrene blue and quinacridone gold. It makes a most interesting dark green. Let's see, here we go, quin gold. Ooh. Now that's a color that's changed a lot. There we go. Okay, and indenthrene. Here. Ooh, that makes a dark, powerful, powerful green. I learned this green from taking uh, Joseph Zavukvich class and everybody was using it, not him so much, but the other artists in the room, which were fabulous artists, were all using it. And I asked them, what is that amazing color? How were you, how did you mix that? And they told me, I went, oh my gosh, I gotta try that. And I like it because it's real clean. What? Uh, quinacridone gold in indenthrene or indenthrone blue. Thank you. You're welcome. So just another strategy, and it reminds me because you've done mountains. So when you want to get 
I'll say mountains instead of just prairie land. Mm -hmm. You know, you use planted lines, you use, um, you know, muted colors for the back. Are, is there anything else? I, I sometimes, like your road looks flat rather than hilly. Uh, that's called perspective. There are two uh, kinds of perspective going on there. There's a linear perspective, which the focal point is right there and, and the lines converge there. And there's a horizon line that's implied right there. See, boom, boom. But there's also color perspective. Bright colors come forward and uh, grayed colors go back. Um, darker colors come forward, lighter colors go back. So back here, we've got lighter colors. Right, this is tint a tint, uh, and the tint will go back compared with the more intense colors down here, or the brighter, warmer colors. Cool goes back, warm comes forward. So we have two kinds of perspective going on here that makes that work. Does that help? Um, yeah, yeah, to some degree, but um, just mine's more like if I if I've got a field, like you have your road, and sometimes uh -huh. it looks like it's really bumpy when I want it to be really flat. And I, I guess it's because I used wavy lines instead of more horizontal lines. So like in your far left-hand corner where you've got the dark blue, it looks flat. And I see you've got mm -hmm. primarily horizontal movements rather than mm -hmm. wavy movements. So that's what I was gonna ask you if I was thinking about that correctly. Oh, well, I think that that, sure, your brush strokes are gonna indicate what kind of service uh, that you're trying to portray. So uh, an illustration of this is imagine that you're painting uh, a still life and you've got a vase in your still life, right? And that vase is round. So if a shadow falls on that vase, is it gonna be flat? So if you indicated the shadow on that vase with a flat line, then your object, your vase is going to appear one dimensional or not three dimensional. But if you make that, that shadow follow the contour of the vase and have it go around, it's going to reinforce the idea that that is a three dimensional object instead of uh, a flat object. And the same thing when you're indicating landscape because landscape is just a series of rolling hills sometimes. Uh, this is man-made, usually, unless you're way out there in the desert, and even then it's kind of hard to find a very, very flat place. I'm thinking about driving across the Enzo Borrego Desert to uh, on a way to Utah or Arizona. That's pretty dang flat, isn't it? Until you come to the mountains out there. So here is an example of that flat plain here where you have, you have a horizon line, you indicate a a focal point and then you have radiating lines from that focal area that indicate that plane is flat. But if you, once you get back into the rolling hills, then you would have one plane, undulating plane overlapping another uh, hilly landscape. And then when you get way in the background, then you have these jagged peaks. You have more intensive, intensive intensity, excuse me, in the foreground and more neutrality or lighter colors in the back. See, it's, that's why this is working here. This blue in this area is more intense than is the area back here. That intensity brings this hill forward. Okay. We would have to have a whole class on that concept. It's kind of hard to, to cover it and make sure that you've grasped it without me working and walking around the classroom or having you hold your painting up to me with toggle back and forth, which we can do, which we did in our, in our uh, portrait class so that I could see what people were doing. We don't really have that kind of time today, but it is something that if you know people really needed it, you could work with Ralph and ask him, gee, I would like to have a class where, uh, you know, we talked about color perspective versus linear perspective. Just as a little, okay. plug, little plug for myself, uh, I have a, uh, a workshop coming up in May at the uh, Watercolor Society on perspective doing- There you go. 
similar sorts of things that I did with you guys at uh, Claremont. Oh, that's uh, great. But anyway. There you go. I'm glad you said that, Ralph. So that's exactly. Thank, thank you. You fed, you fed me perfectly on there. <laughs> and we didn't even rehearse it. That's no, amazing. We're just in, in <laughs> sync. You were just in sync. But that kind of thing, you know, the more classes you take on it, uh, the more books, the more you try it, go outside and, you know, paint your backyard. Um, and think, think about it, because it sounds like you've observed uh, what makes things work, you know, just the indication, brush indications are part of it. But yeah, take Ralph's workshop. Or you could simply call me up and we could talk. No, take Ralph's workshop. <laughs> Thank you. I think Nancy, we should move on to uh, the yeah. students doing this uh, this painting now. Uh, we only have about uh, yes. fifteen minutes left, and go ahead, guys. So I've got a question for you, Nancy. Back to the color, the tetradic color theme. Uh -huh. So it's two opposite colors on the color wheel. I know it's a kind quadrangle. I still don't quite I, I would, grasp this one. Um, yes. And so, I looked at that picture. My color wheel doesn't look just like that one. So it doesn't, you know, it looks see, similar. See, that, that's, the, that's the challenge. So mm -hmm. let me take Steve's wheel because Steve's wheel doesn't have any anything. Uh, whoops. Need to move this off of there because it's going to get. Seeing you've used touched. a purple, so you've got the orange, which is the uh, the complement of purple. So those are opposites. Well, let, me get the big, yeah. let me get the color wheel out. All right, here. thank you. Uh huh. And they this are set seem... up a little different. Yeah, they are a different color wheel. So this <clears> one <throat> is set up. This is Steve's. And Steve uses pure colors to do his paintings, meaning spectrum colors, colors that are one pigment hues and they're on the outside mm -hmm. of the color wheel. And um, so I think this is kind of easy to see is that I, I, I did the red violet. And if I go right across the color wheel, I get this permanent green light, right? right. So I could argue with you and say, yes, I have yellow green in this color scheme because I have it uh, I have it here and I have it explored it and I could put it right there as well. So I will tell you that, and you will find this out, it's a range of color. It is not exactly uh, which colors are across. Um, so for instance, Say we, we've got, you can visualize this, you're all very visual people. So we have, you know what Delft uh, porcelain is? It's, it's got blue, it's cobalt blue designs on it, right? It has a white background nice. and cobalt blue designs on it. Mm -hmm. the, if you were painting that in the still life and you wanted to have the complement complementary color in a flower, so which, yellow is that going to be if it, it, it's you know you could say roughly speaking or loosely speaking the delft would be cobalt blue but who's cobalt blue right because it it varies dye lot to dye lot so it may be a little bit over here or it could be a little bit more of a blue greeny cobalt so it's going to be in a range it's not going to be exactly as I found out by trying to create simultaneous contrast in just that case. If you go onto my website and you go to florals and you look for a Delft still life and you'll see I have uh, sunflowers in it. I was struggling to create uh, those sunflowers using a color that would evoke simultaneous colors. Uh, simultaneous contrast by having the them be complementary right across the color wheel. And that was quite a lot of work for all the reasons I just told you. It's that different manufacturers have different pigments in the tubes, so they're not going to look exactly like what you expect. So you've got to, it's trial and error. So for this, today, I have gone 
roughly speaking, here to here, right? And from here to here. So it would be this, 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 and that. So that is our rough sort of, it's, you know, it's, it's a rectangle, but are, is it, you know, you're gonna say, okay, it's gonna be every three colors, or it's gonna be every four colors. It's not gonna be one of those things. It's gonna be a generality. It's gonna be um, orange against a blue, which is down here, and the green against the violet over here. And so if I take those four colors and I put them out like that, you get it, but it doesn't quite match up on that color wheel. It's not perfectly, yeah. but I bet I could create a color wheel where I could make it. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Seriously. I mean, I'm not being facetious. It's just if we took the uh, handprint color wheel, it's another whole story. Um, it depends on who created the color wheel. Which which color wheel is this one? This one's the quiller wheel, and it's up for purchase. You can That's buy very it. Very popular. Steam. Yeah, I love it because um, it's it can be seen across the classroom. If I am trying to make a point. Ugh. Okay, but see, this one is going to be completely different. This is a value color wheel and it's gonna look completely different. And this color wheel by Bruce, uh, you see is not even a literal wheel. Um, this one on the outside has a spectrum and uh, with numbers on it, it all, all has to do with uh, color and light wavelengths. So it just depends on what the person's emphasizing is what the color is going to look, uh, color wheel is going to look like. Well, thank you for re-explaining that. I feel like that it is that was a complicated. Uh, it is a scheme. complicated thing. Yeah. yeah, it is. A tetradic is, and that there is actually five uh, color, one co uh, color scheme that actually has five pigments, and they call it a pentradic color wheel. <laughs> And well, let's not go there pretty, today. <laughs> yeah, there's just too much to go into today, but just trust me. <laughs> Color is complicated and it's relative. Okay, we're back to this. How are you doing? Is everybody painting? Is everything going okay? Another question, I'm sitting here looking at this and I don't have, you know, it's white at the back, that little square. In your mind, what was that gonna be back there? This square? At the very back of the road. If you go down the road and it's white. Oh, I see. That's a house roof. Aha, uh -huh. okay. That's a house roof with a little chimney on it. I think that probably uh, it's gotten blurred out. Maybe I can make that more distinct. Let's make, try to make that more distinct. That's a, that's, no, it's a chalet. Maybe it's the resort my uh, in-laws were staying at in Alaska. There we go. There we go. You know, um, before we, my husband and I went to Abruzzo, this little town in this little area, uh, it's a province actually, but we visited a town where my family lived a hundred years ago uh, called Pesco Costanza up in the mountains. And it actually helped us find our house, our rental house, driving Google Drive uh, helped us find it. And it hel helped a great deal because we arrived after dark, never would have been able to find it had we not uh, Google driven it before time.
Does that look more like a little house? There we go. Little yeah. house in the mountains. Little house, we yeah, are a little chalet. A little getaway. Um, I went up there myself and I took a workshop from Judy Betts in uh, Anchorage. It was quite fun. I don't know if she's still doing them, but she was doing them annually in Anchorage. Probably not this year, but it was a great deal of fun. Folks, we have uh, Nan for about another 10 or 15 minutes. So if you have any other questions that you haven't posed yet, please feel free. We've got, we've got her trapped. So <laughs> she can't escape. I can't escape. She, she, I can't escape. She's trapped in Zoom. Yeah, in, in our virtual reality. But um, if you, you know, say that if you want something like um, a class that you know that um, I specialize in, just contact me and request it and I'll put you on the list and I'll work toward that. As soon as I get these paintings done, like I said, I'll be putting up some, hopefully I'll be putting up some videos. Um, Tell them your website URL. Um, it's just nancyalexa.com. So are you doing commission pieces or just things that you want to do? Uh, right now, um, I the, the, what I have to do, actually, it's uh, for a very big, big, big uh, show. And um, I sort of obligated to do it. So I said I would do it and I have to do it. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore, lest I get too nervous. <laughs> I'll let you know when it's all over, kind of thing. NancyAlexa.com, eh? Maybe they'll be on your website when you're done. Or is it NanAlexa.com? Uh, eventually, yeah. Yeah, probably a year from now, actually. Everything takes so long. Is it Nancy or NanAlexa.com? You know, Nan is a name I grew up with. Uh, it's what everybody called me. Uh, that was outside of school. When I went to school, I was Nancy. And then, you know, for various reasons, I have to, have to do with, with mostly with work and with Palomar College, um, I used my proper name instead of the name I grew up with. I go by Nan, but um, Nancy is just more formal. It's like Joe and Joseph. So it's actually nancyalexa.com, but I could change it to Nan. Okay. Anytime I want, but right now I it's Nancy. Sure we had it, but uh, when you see Nan, it's me. Go ahead. I just wanted to make sure we had it properly, and and folks. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's Nancy. Her last name is O L E K S A. Some people have right. put S farther up in the word, but uh, this is Olexa. Yeah, no, Olexa. Nancy. So in yes. your street, your road going back, you've done what I was kind of talking about. You've got the uh, perspective on the road going back with the perspective lines, but then you've made some um, pinkish lines horizontal across it, which are uh -huh. not perspective lines. So is, is there a particular reason why you created those horizontal lines? Well, yes, yes. It connects one side with the other. They're also okay. shadows. And they're also shadows. So if you want to think about them as being objects, but I really think of them as horizontal connectors. They also indicate that the road is flat by keeping, if I, if I made this line undulating, then it would look like there was a dip in the road. Right, okay, so that, that nailed it, that you, the straight line, of course, it looks flat because it doesn't go through ruts and so forth, so that, that kind of brought it home. Thank you. Mm -hmm. like but remember, you don't need to be you don't need to be tied to reality. If 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 the line should be undulating, per your artistic vision, make it undulating. You know. Absolutely. 
it's what you call expression, you know. Yeah. Um, or artistic it's license. When you, I, I, oh, I love that artistic license. Yes. Artie Westerman uh, was an illustrator. He gave class at uh, the Watercolor Society, and at the end of the workshop, he all gave us a signed artistic license. He <laughs> gave us the ability to go out. Yeah, he did. He My had them made up. You know, and they were they were printed in in uh, you know he'd put them made them up on the computer with all our names on them. That was really cute. Yeah, see, this is Rhonda. I'm just curious how long you've been painting for. My you, painting, uh, probably painting, painting since I was 13. I began a win, winning awards when I was 13. And then I got a full scholarship to college on my portfolio. Wow. But I've really been drawing. Yeah, I've been drawing since I was three because my mother was very good. So I would watch my mother draw. And uh, that kind of you know spark something but she was very good it was unfortunate that she uh was never trained she would have always loved to have gone to art school but that wasn't possible for her wow. but yeah i had a talented family So folks, I will be putting this up on uh, Zoom, I'm sorry, on uh, YouTube in a few days. Uh, so you can, if you've missed anything that she's said, you can catch it again. It's at uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, the channel is Tuesday Art Group and uh, all of our videos are up, up there. And uh, Nancy, I will be giving you a video of this on uh, a thumb drive so that you can, Perfect. can have that. Perfect. I, I'll reimburse you for the thumb drive. Thank you very much. Or simply copy it and yeah. return it to me, whatever. But Oh, there you go, too. Yeah. Not, yeah. Um, let's see. I, 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 yeah, that's perfect, Ralph. Thank you. Okay. And I'll be sending uh, some money to you. I've got the... Got the uh, check in the mail here, and uh, it'll be going out today. So nice. uh, thank you so much for your, your expertise and your artistry. And uh, uh, I've certainly enjoyed it greatly. Fabulous. I'm going to switch toggle back now to say, are we, are we ending? I think we will yeah. end, yes. Yes. OK. If you have any final okay. words to say. Just Thank you so on. much, Nancy. This was great. I enjoyed Thank you, it. I learned a lot. Perfect. I learned a lot. Learned Thank a lot. you. Thank I you. Thank you very much. Good information. Happy painting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. okay. I'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. Love Bye. you guys. Bye. 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 Merry Christmas, Bye. everybody. Our next demo will be Merry with Bong Lee in January. Thank you, Ralph. Okay. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Ralph.